please give us a call at 240-773-5900 or visit Deuce on the web because he really needs to get out of here. He needs to go home with you. With that, we close this edition of County Report this week. Remember to like us on Facebook and to join us again at this time every week for a look at what's going on inside Montgomery County. We leave you today with some scenes from East Norbeck Park, where people were playing tennis and basketball after work and school this week. I'm Lorna Virgili, and thank you for watching. Park City Council to order. The, please, the clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Stewart. Here. Councilmember Kovar. Here. Councilmember Stevens. Present. Councilmember Mayo. Here. Councilmember Smith. Here. Councilmember Qureshi. Councilmember Schultz. Here. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, we have no changes to this evening's agenda. Looking uh, to next week on March 16th, yes, we will um, begin with a closed session uh, that the City Council is going to be ha having a public safety briefing with the police chief. And then we will start our public meeting at 7.30 with uh, two voting items. The first is a first reading ordinance authorizing budget amendment number three for FY 2016. We will then also have a first reading ordinance authorizing the execution of an amended agreement with our attorneys for legal services for the development at Tacoma Junction. Uh, we have two work sessions scheduled for next week, um, one with uh, Neighborhood Development Company regarding the Tacoma Junction redevelopment. Um, just to let everyone know, on Sunday, the council did meet with our uh, development attorneys, Bregman, um, Burbat, Schwartz, and Gilday. Uh, and we're moving forward with negotiations on the development agreement, and we look forward to having uh, NDC with us for a work session next Monday. In addition to that work session, um, excuse me, next Wednesday, um, in addition to that work session next Wednesday, we will also be discussing a zoning text amendment that is in front of the county council regarding bed and breakfast um, and transit housing licensing and regulations. And then the following week on Wednesday, March 23rd, we will have a first reading ordinance uh, establishing a vacant and abandoned property registry. We will have the second reading ordinance amending the code regarding stormwater management fees. We will have a resolution, um, a potential resolution commenting on the zoning text amendment on uh, the bed and breakfast that we will be discussing next week. And then we'll have a resolution appointing the Tacoma Park Poet Laureate, a tentative resolution providing appointments to committees, the second reading ordinance uh, regarding the budget amendment number three for FY 2016, and the second reading ordinance authorizing execution of an amended agreement with our attorneys regarding development at Tacoma Junction. We have three work ses sessions scheduled uh, for the 23rd. One is review of the community grants program, we will continue discussing options for LED, LED conversion of streetlights in Tacoma Park. 
and we are tentatively scheduled to discuss synchronizing Tacoma Park elections with state and federal elections on March 23rd. The following week, the last week of March, we will not have a council meeting. Um, so the last week of March, we will not have a council meeting. And then beginning in April, don't worry, we're going to have lots of council meetings. <laughs> um, beginning April 6th, uh, we will have the city manager's presentation of the FY 2017 budget. And we will also have the second reading ordinance establishing vacant and abandoned property registry. We will then uh, be meeting on Monday, April 11th for a budget work session. Uh, that meeting will start at 7.30. On Wednesday, April 13th, um, we will have a public hearing on the 20 FY 2017 budget, as well as a public hearing on the ordinance amending the Tacoma Park Code regarding the use, um, the plastic bag um, ban that we discussed uh, a couple of weeks ago. And then we have two work sessions scheduled for April 13th. One is uh, the continued discussion of the proposed library design and discussion of proposed revisions to the community grants program. Um, that then takes us to Monday, April uh, 18th, uh, which will have another budget work session. And then on Wednesday, April 20th, we have tentatively scheduled a public hearing on the streetscape manual. Uh, and well, that takes us to later April. All right. Uh, now we will have public comments on voting items this evening. We have three voting items. Uh, the first one that we will take public comments on is the second reading ordinance amending the code regarding multifamily facilities to change the filing date of the annual report. Um, does anyone have any comments regarding that? Oh, okay, second voting item is the first reading ordinance amending the code regarding stormwater management fee system. Any comments on that? Our third voting item is a single reading ordinance authorizing the purchase of energy efficient windows for the community center on the third floor. Any public comments on that? Okay, now we will go to other public comments. Um, if you have comments on other topics, please come to the podium, uh, state your name and where you live, and you have three minutes, please. My name is David Wyman. My wife and I, my wife sitting over there, live at uh, Albany and Buffalo. Uh, we're the big Victorian on the house uh, on the corner that looks down on the park. And, we're the ones that decorate for Halloween every year. So that's our claim to fame. We've been here for over 30 years. I don't come down here very often. And an awful lot of people come down to complain about something. I came down to say thank you. Um, I know that's shocking to a lot of you. <laughs> the, the faces tell a story. Um, the college has proposed an expansion um, they took an agreement with the city, with Historic Tacoma, and with others, and they jettisoned it. Um, it's pretty contemptuous. Um, it's pretty arrogant on their part. They put a plan together, and their answer is, we don't need to talk to you, even though we had a written agreement to do so. Um, I thought of all sorts of trashy things to say about the provost, and you don't want to hear them, uh, and I don't want to <laughs> utter them, but I'm going to make one comment. You know, you're all elected officials. Step back for a moment. We're, we're in an election season. Everybody knows it. it's in the news every hour. And we know that one of the themes this year is that people are angry. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about anger and the college's contempt for the community, you know, the provost is, is part of a, an element of government that says, we don't have to listen to you. We don't have to engage with you. We don't have to talk to you. And they even have a little section in the report that their master plan about how the community is, you know, it's a difficult community. They knew. So they calculatingly figured out a way to avoid dealing with us. It breeds the kind of anger. And I certainly feel it when I, I don't come down here. I don't rail about a lot of things. I am deeply offended by what the college did and what they, what they did. I want to thank you for your letter. What needs to happen is very simple. The, the, the Higher Education Commission needs to remand that proposal back to the college. The college needs to go through regular order. And we need to know 
all, the, the range of issues, whether it's crime, whether it's parking, whether it's traffic, whether it's the square footage game that's being played. And I know the college is probably uh, monitoring this and, and somebody's busy taking notes and writing emails saying, oh my God, somebody showed up and trashed us. Well, um, I did and they deserve it. Thank you very much. Um, Peter, thank you for taking the initiative. Um, you're new here and you're jumping in with both feet and the water's deep. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any other public comments this evening? Mr. Loveless? Mm -hmm. Yes, my name is Pat Loveless, the official peace delegate. One thing I want people to start thinking of is registering to vote. I know that uh, people out there are thinking about how crazy the election has been this year. And I think they should uh, all look over the candidates and see which one they really want the most, which one's going to really serve our environment, which one's going to really serve our people, which one's really going to help uh, house the poor and feed the hungry, things that the United States had always said it stood for, is caring for our fellow men, slowing down the violence around the world, stop these damn sending guns out to different uh, countries of the world so they can turn around and fire them against us again. I think we should try to get the people to uh, get out there and vote. Because remember, April 26th is the uh, primary in Maryland. And I think we should really be aware of that. That's only a few short weeks away. That's about a month and a half away at the most. So I think we should try to get out there and uh, take advantage of it and get young 16-year-olds to vote in Tacoma Park. And I think we should try to get our uh, our older people to get out there and register to vote too because a lot of them just sit back and watch the ball games and stuff and watch the TV. When that's a day I say, I don't watch TV, I'm down at the polls with the peace sign. And I should be out there this year too. So I'm, ho I'm hoping to be out there with the peace sign this year, spreading peace and I'm keeping it on the people's consciousness on what they, what they really want peace to be. And also another thing I think we should do is uh, try to I brought up a few weeks ago about the drones. This time, and the chief of police uh, uh, g gave us the rundown on the illegality of drones in this area. I think we should try to get it put in the newspapers and on the Tacoma Park Channel that, that they are not illegal in this uh, area for security reasons also. And I'm very proud to see the chief of police stood up and uh, spoke up about that. A lot of people that I talked to about it and they saw it on the TV are very glad to hear it. So please, get that on the TV and out in the newspapers about the illegality of our drones in our speech with the police, chief of police said uh, a couple of weeks ago on the, uh, when he uh, spoke about the uh, crime report. I'm very proud of it. And also, can you fix that, uh, that soda machine out there so I can get my diet sodas? <laughs> Something's wrong with it. Been wrong with it for a while. And also, I'd like to uh, ask everybody to uh, think about our environment. The weather is nice out today, but is it normal? I remember horror movies start with a funny beginning, and they end with a horrible ending sometimes. And I don't want this to be our environment show. So please, get out there and do what we can to save our environment this year. Thank you very much. Love it, love it, love it. Thank you. Any other public comments this evening? Hope so. Okay. Hi, a lot of you all know me. I'm Ward 2, Mary Jane Machui. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here for some of my pet uh, begs. I hate to beg, but my son, I guess all you know, has autism. And Mr. Kovar just spoke with me briefly today, and he sort of saw her class, sort of some of the people in our class. We have a spirit club class every Wednesday night just before this meeting, and you're all welcome to sit in to see us. And... Uh, I would really like this class to be free to all Tacoma Park residents. Currently, it's like almost $100 a month, which is out of some people, many people's uh, budgets. And uh, we put in a grant to get four people half price. But even half price is like almost $50. That's, you know, why can't it? We, there are a lot of 
free classes for seniors. Why can't we have one free class, please? And we can't even, we're not even allowed to put in the recreation guide, they say, for some unknown reason, some jurisdictional reason, which I don't understand. And please be able to do that. And I have as parents of special needs uh, adults uh, group that meets my home once a month. If you're all interested or know somebody who might be interested, see me, please. And my thing is gentrification. Right? <laughs> I'm really concerned about, uh, it seems like everybody is concerned, which is good, about low cost rental, but there's no cost mortgage, low cost mortgages in Tacoma Park homes. You're lucky to get a ho house for 500,000. That's not even that great. There are places there, like I said, they're making McMansions on Lincoln Avenue, three blocks where I live. Those houses are being sold for almost 900,000 on the market for that price. It's, and, and, the, and, and black people are moving out of my street, okay? I, I'm in a multiracial, I moved in here, multiracial, multi-economic neighborhood, which I really love, but it's coming. It's becoming, you have to be wealthy, and it's mostly, I hate to use a bad term, yuppies are moving in, and, and, and they're taking over, they're buying these $800,000 houses, and the other people are moving out because taxes are going up and we can't afford them. There are ways you can apply for some tax relief, which I've used recently, and thank you for Montgomery County for that program, okay? But still, it, it's still out of, you know, out of our reach, and I really hate the way our neighborhood's turning into. I mean, I like the mixture, economic and racial. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments this evening? Oh, oh. No, go ahead. No, 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 please, please. I wasn't going to speak. Oh, well, forget <laughs> it. <laughs> Good evening, Council. Ian Barkley, Cedar Avenue. I'm here on my repetitive concern, which is the library redo, and the missed opportunities I've witnessed to engage the people who are ultimately going to pay for this thing. And I'm an old fart, you know, I'll be around for a little while longer, but not a whole lot longer. It's the young people, the people that I see in my neighborhood that have small children whose children are going to utilize this library, hopefully, on an ongoing, regular basis and develop a love for the printed word, which will guide them through their life. And on this concern, I'm not going to yield. There's been so many missed opportunities, like the uh, play day the other day. The library was closed. The library should have had somebody out there engaging these young parents, many of them, you know, scraping together some serious money to purchase, just as that lady just said, a home in Tacoma Park, and they should have been soliciting their input. Uh, the list of people, there's a number of people in my neighborhood that are new. <clears throat> Every one of those people should be contacted and asked, what do you see as a library? What do you want in the next 20 years? Because those are the kids that are going to be used in the library, hopefully, because in my personal opinion, having grown up in that library, uh, the library is for adults as well, but it's really for the small kids. There's nothing like watching the story hour, which my mother started, and seeing two-year-old kids, you know, two-and-a-half, three-year-old kids listening to, uh, I forget the guy's name, but plays the guitar, and, and just having a good old time and looking at all the different books on the shelves and observing uh, perhaps their first gateway into words and what words can do, because words are power. And so I really encourage the city council to hold the uh, library director's feet to the fire I attended all those meetings. The uh, fellow that's Luke Meyer has just out of hand dismissed a lot of legitimate concerns and designs. And I looked up parking spaces. The parking spaces in the parking lot out there were already downsized once, I believe. I know they were resized at some point a few years ago. And the idea of uh, we're going to get all this extra parking by making the parking space is so small that every time you open the door, somebody's going to be smacking into somebody else's car, and the next thing you'll be having a, you know, a altercation or something like that, because, hey, you dented my $10,000 new paint job or something. So please hold their feet to the fire and make this library something that will be world class and that everyone will be proud of. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
any other comments this evening? Okay, we'll turn to council comments now. Councilmember Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. I just uh, want to congratulate the Washington Dentist Hospital. They had their brown groundbreaking ceremony this week, and uh, we should all on the council take that as a green flag to uh, start our uh, movement towards what's going to be left here mm -hmm. behind in Tacoma Park when the hospital's gone. Thank you. Councilmember Schultz. Yeah. Um, I want to thank uh, David Wyman, who I believe uh, departed right after he made his remarks. So in his absence, I just want to, if he were here, this is, I would just say that I was in full agreement with the choice of his words. I can, could not do it any better with regard to uh, the uh, attitude and strategies of the uh, Montgomery Community College. I'll just leave it at that. But, you know, it is appalling is what I guess I could add, say. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, is to talk about commercial signs for a few minutes. Um, if you, uh, you may not know this, uh, but in Montgomery County there is an ordinance that regulates signs on businesses um, and the, the county uh, it's a county law and the county enforces it uh, but if you were driving down New Hampshire Avenue for example or along parts of uh, University Boulevard that are in Tacoma Park you might not think that there is a sign ordinance um, so I've been concerned about this for a long time because New Hampshire Avenue and that part of University Boulevard are in my ward, um, a lot of the uh, there's a lot of stores that have signs that are frankly illegal. Uh, but nobody's been paying attention to that at, at the county level. So uh, this past week, um, I had the opportunity to address County Executive Isaiah Leggett face to face at the. Uh, MML, Maryland Municipal League chapter meeting. It's a meeting we have, the chapter has with the county executive once a year. So we get to ask questions and, and I'd raise this as an issue and asked if there isn't some way that we can get the county uh, to start enforcing something uh, that has not been paid any attention to by the county for as long as I can remember. So he took it, gave me a very positive response. Um, and the n next day, I received a call from four officials of the county, all on the same phone call, asking me what I, they could do to take care of this problem. We had a long discussion. Uh, and basically, what they're proposing to do is something that will start very soon. Um, they're going to form two teams of county of, of enforcement officials to walk, go walk every, to every business in the New Hampshire Avenue corridor between Eastern Avenue and University Boulevard and along some of the other streets that were businesses uh, to pass out literature about this, the ordinance, what the law requires, to ask property owners and tenants to cooperate to conform their signage to what the law allows and they're going to try to do this on three different three to three times through through the mail or face to face and then after that they'll start handing out notices of violation NOVs um, to get people to uh, to, to do what they're supposed to do I'm, I'm basically in a nutshell uh, the, the they're they're doing something that uh, everything that I w have asked or would have asked they also ask for an opportunity uh, D Diane Jones the uh, director of the Department of Permitting Services for to come and speak to this to the Tacoma Park City Council and she's also agreed to have her people come and speak to the board of directors of the Crossroads Development Authority and I said we would be we would welcome both opportunities. So that will be something that 
uh, I've already reported all this information to my colleagues on the council, but um, we'll be, hopefully we'll be able to schedule in the not too distant future for the city council. Um, but I also want to say that tonight is an opportunity for anybody who's listening to this uh, to, to this uh, session tonight to be to become aware of the fact that there's going to be changes for businesses in the city with regard to the enforcement of the sign ordinance, the Montgomery County ordinance governing the size uh, and the quantity of signs and that sort of thing. It's complicated. I'm not going to explain it here. So that's a very big, good piece of good news, which I'm delighted to share with you. Thank you. Councilmember Smith. Mayor, could you let Councilmember? Absolutely. Someone else, because I'm going to be long-winded. So. Okay. <laughs> Thanks Thank for the you. heads up. Councilmember Kovar. See if you're going to be longer winded than me. <laughs> it's, um, it's really not a contest that, uh, that we want to do. <laughs> if I'd known that. Yeah. Um, just a few things which are quick, I think. Um, one, people may be aware that the, uh, there's a contractor um, with funding mainly from COG, the Council of Governments, that is doing a study on parking. It's mainly in wards three and one, and we'll be taking their findings in June. <clears throat> and seeing where to go from there. Um, I've looked over the proposed um, scope of the study. I've discussed this with the city manager and, and with the mayor and also uh, with uh, council member uh, Qureshi. And I think overall the scope of work looks pretty good. The one thing that I think is lacking and that I think we should try to find a way to do is um, a, a little bit more public engagement as we, as we go forward because uh, at the moment the plan is for the public to there be a meeting of the public at the end of the process and I'm just sort of thinking about the people I represent and knowing that they would like to weigh in a little bit sooner than that. So we can talk more about that later. Um, I do want to follow on with what Council Member Schultz said. I appreciated uh, Mr. Wyman's comments uh, with regard to the uh, Montgomery College, and we're continuing to uh, reach out to our elected officials at both the county and state level to see what we can do to uh, make some progress there. Um, on COG, the Council of Governments, I was at the board meeting today and they spent a lot of time on um, an analysis and projections of the what the economy will look like in the greater Washington area over the next 30 years actually and one thing that struck me was uh, the population increases that are anticipated and this is just a projection over 30 years so you can uh, assume that they're not going to be exactly right but they did say in Montgomery County the population was projected to increase by 22.5 percent and even with my glasses, it's hard to read this, but I think it, that's something like 232,000 new uh, residents. So, you know, pretty substantial number over time. Obviously, that raises questions about housing, and um, again, it's in line with our uh, conversation the other day about housing that, that we had here. But I was also at a, a couple of events that the National League of Cities did, and one of them featured some discussions on ideas for what smaller cities can do to promote affordable housing. And I'll be following up with the experts that they had speaking on that topic. And another one that I thought was interesting, and this is my, my last comment, um, <laughs> was on uh, expanding um, digital connections for uh, lower income uh, communities. And they were talking even about something called the, the homework gap. So even, yes, obviously the as Mr. Barkley pointed out, the, the library is a great place for kids to to get the connections that they can, but you can't send a young kid off by himself to the library. And so um, one of the things that they're, they're talking about at this meeting, and I'm going to follow up with them as well, is what are some strategies for cities to expand the, for want of a better term, the Internet connections that are available to uh, have that as widely as possible within the city. So I think that's something that we should also consider it, I think it would fall under our priorities document that we approved. So, thanks. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. First, a couple of announcements. One, uh, I want to thank Keith Berner and Marty Itner for hosting a meeting tomorrow with the Executive Director of Hope Restored with uh, members of Ward 5 to talk about Hope Restored potentially locating in the vacant storefront 
uh, on Flower and Erie Avenue. So I encourage everyone to come out. If, uh, if they have an RSVP, they can send me an email and I'll make sure that Keith gets it. Uh, the second announcement is on March 16th at 7 p.m. Washington Vintage University is hosting another community meeting to discuss uh, the new building that they will want to build on Maplewood. They think construction is going to start this spring, so please come out. This would be a great opportunity to uh, see some of the renderings and ask the uh, CFO of the University, Patrick Farley, any questions you have. Um, and we will also discuss Hope Restored. Um, the university, uh, through a foundation, owns the retail strip on Flower and Erie. Uh, so this would be their uh, potential tenant. So switching gears to uh, legislative items before Maryland's General Assembly. First item regarding the highway user revenue bill that MML is sponsoring. Uh, the bill is moving forward. Uh, the city of Baltimore originally was not in the legislation, so they have proposed an amendment uh, so that they are covered. And today, uh, during a conference call, I learned that there is a new strategy that it's going to be all or nothing. So. If the bill does not pass this session, then municipalities will not get any grants. So I guess this is going to, you know, put more leverage on the committee to, to give it a favorable rating so that it comes out. But uh, that was the latest news that came out today. But it looks like it is moving forward. And um, this bill would make it so that before the Great Recession, municipalities would get the amount of money that they are supposed to get from highway user revenue from the state. Uh, next bill that I wanted to bring up uh, it regards uh, program open space. Uh, that there, there's a bill of this session uh, that puts what you would consider a lockbox so that the governor cannot raid in the future program open space. This bill is moving forward, so we look forward to it passing. And finally, uh, HB 666, this is the legal notice requirement bill. This seems to be a perennial bill so that municipalities have the opportunity to give legal notices on the websites and other means, a newsletter other than a newspaper. And once again, this bill has died. <laughs> it has received an unfavorable rating in the committee, so it will probably be back next session. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. All right, I have a couple of announcements. Um, one um, regarding what uh, Council Member Siemens raised uh, about the hospital moving. Um, just wanted to let people know that the Deputy City Manager is working with representatives from Washington Adventist Hospital uh, to find a date for a community meeting that will be held at the hospital so that residents can um, find out from the hospital administration um, what their plans are for the campus and then discuss um, options for moving forward and other things that uh, might be there, and so hopefully soon that date will be announced. Oh, can we get announced? Has yeah, it? We have, uh, the, the date of the first meeting will be April 5th at 6.30, and it will be held at WA. Uh, more details uh, are forthcoming, okay. and we'll include them in the, the newsletter before the event. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Um, let's see. The uh, second item, I just wanted to follow up again with Councilmember Siemens raised last week regarding the Zika virus, and I was wondering if we could um, think about putting some of our social media bandwidth behind that. I was struck this morning listening to the morning news that every day there seems to be these tips that come out from the CDC, like when you apply sunscreen versus bug spray, um, that I think would be useful um, through that, and then possibly other means, um, like the newsletter. Um, uh, the uh, Third item is I want to thank uh, Council Member Smith um, for a terrific morning coffee last Friday at Natra Tea at, uh, on Erie and Flower. 
and to announce that we have our next uh, Friday coffee scheduled for April 20, no, April 15th, thank you, April 15th uh, at Capital City Cheesecake. It will be a combined Ward 3 with Council Member uh, Qureshi and Ward 1 with Council Member Kovar. So that's April 15th at Capital City Cheesecake. Um, tomorrow evening, the Crossroads Community F Food Network is presenting a series of short documentaries that explore how food unites and nurtures a community. Um, this, there's a reception that begins at 6.30 here at the Community Center and screenings begin at 7.30. Um, and finally, I have, uh, in addition to Councilmember Smith's uh, legislative updates, uh, a quick update. Um, we've been working through our uh, lobbyists in Annapolis to get language inserted into uh, this year's budget on two items. The first is on uh, utilities. As you may recall, uh, the council discussed last year uh, the issue of utilities and state highway coming in and ripping up our sidewalks or our streets and then somebody else coming in and doing the same thing within a short amount of time and the lack of coordination uh, and unfortunately the lack of leverage that the city has to get the utilities and state highway to all coordinate and work together. Um, so far we have been successful in getting the language in the subcommittee's report that will go to the full committee on the budget to request that uh, State Highway and the Maryland Department of Transportation um, submit a report by next November answering um, questions about uh, this process and how it is expensive and, and impacts lo local municipalities. Hopefully this report will then help us move forward on uh, legislation for next year. Yeah. It also is the New Hampshire. Avenue. Right, I was going to get there. Oh, the like next, I'm done. getting there. <laughs> and then the next item uh, we had is on New Hampshire corridor economic development um, and potential there. And that's questions that will go to the Maryland Department of Commerce and the State Highway and the Maryland Department of Transportation. Again, to um, answer key questions about economic development along the New Hampshire Avenue corridor. So hopefully those will stay in uh, the budget. Uh, as they uh, vote on it moving forward. Um, so that's it for me, um, City Manager. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to um, just very briefly address um, Councilmember Kovar's question about um, public input into um, parking and the portion that's being done by the kind of COG related traffic study is one small portion of the whole thing and there are some public opportunities for comment on the larger parking issues. Um, so I'll bring back a schedule and, and the opportunities for that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just a quick follow-up. Uh, I did want to assure Councilmember Mail that we have been um, going past the house on Colby Avenue that he has of interest. Um, the foundation wall has still not been uh, moved back, um, and the county officials have been alerted, so we are keeping on top of it. Just wanted you to know that. Um, neighborhood Energy Challenge ends this month, so if you're in that process and you haven't uh, got everything in, um, please do so. Um, the specifics of that, I think we can ask the Public Works Department um, exactly what's needed by the end of the month. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is that we're mostly doing city budget, so um, I haven't been as responsive as um, I would have liked. Um, the, um, important thing that I want to cover this evening, I'm actually going to have Daryl Braithwaite, our Public Works Director, uh, talk about now, and it has to do with um, some um, issues that have raised, arisen with the Carroll Avenue Bridge renovation. <laughs> Daryl? Hi. Any of you around during the day may have noticed that uh, State Highway's contractor, Kewitt Construction, and their subcontractor has been starting to do installation of some of the traffic signals and the pedestrian signals, particularly at Maple and Sligo Creek Parkway and Maple and the hospital uh, entrance. So that's resulted in some single lane closures and some traffic flaggers and, and whatnot. And that'll be ongoing through the week and probably into next week. I, I just wanted to, uh, um, our construction manager sits on a weekly meeting with State Highway and Kewitt to keep up on the progress of the work and uh, most importantly, kind of keep track of the schedule and. Uh, various aspects of uh, decisions that are made as construction never goes exactly the way you think it will. 
<clears throat> or you hope it will. <clears throat> so there's a couple of things that uh, we were made aware of and wanted to um, have a conversation briefly this evening just to make the council aware of it and sort of take a look at what the city wants to uh, urge going forward. Um, so the first thing is that uh, coming up towards the um, last week of March here, March 21st to the 25th, uh, Kewitt Construction is intending to um, have some delivery of some fairly large materials on tractor trailers, beams, and whatnot. And so they've asked uh, Park and Planning to allow them to close Sligo Creek Parkway during the day uh, from 9 to 3.30 <clears throat> to enable those trucks to, to come in, offload, uh, and then move on out of the way for additional trucks. Um, our understanding is that Park and Planning is, has uh, accepted that, though they haven't formally uh, issued whatever permits required to allow Sligo Creek Parkway to be closed. Uh, we've asked for additional information about their detour route because uh, up until this time there had been no discussion about the closure of Sligo Creek Parkway. Um, <clears throat> so I have gotten from them and can send to you um, their detour plan. And so uh, at this point what it looks like they're proposing <clears throat> is to detour traffic uh, up Old Carroll uh, to, to the juncture with Carroll Avenue across Lincoln Avenue to Maple and then continue on Maple Avenue <clears throat> excuse me, until it joins again Sligo Creek Parkway. So uh, just a kind of a, a single block workaround. Again, that detour is planned for the daytime hours. Um, they intend at this point to uh, put up detour signage and um, their request will be to restrict parking on Old Carroll and on Lincoln Avenue between Carroll and Jefferson. I think there's probably right off the bat some additional requests that we will have um, going forward to make this uh, less impactful to the neighborhood. First and foremost, I know that the residents on Jefferson Avenue will be quite concerned <clears throat> about the potential for drivers trying to cut through Jefferson as a kind of a a quick in and out if they they know that so uh, we'll be um, wanting to make the neighborhood aware of it and um, not only those folks on Jefferson but those folks on on uh, Lincoln and, and Old Carroll uh, we've asked um, Kewitt and State Highway to uh, give us a signing plan a roadway marking plan uh, as well as a notification plan um, so um, <clears throat> that is all happening fairly quickly. Um, they would like to put the detour um, in place in next week so that on the 21st there all the signs are up and notifications been provided and they're ready to go. Um, so that's the first thing. <clears throat> and that will make the second thing seem like a breeze. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, the second issue is uh, it's, it's become uh, the, the contractor, Kewitt, is um, saying that they need to do some of the demolition of the bridge at night. Um, so there's a section of the um, bridge uh, for, for the intention uh, of the original design and the work was to put a, what they call a shield, basically you build a structure underneath the bridge so that as you demolish it, things land on that shield and you have equipment that moves it off and puts it into containment and hauls it away. And that will be able to be done everywhere under the bridge with the exception of over the roadway. Apparently the distance between the road to the underneath of the bridge is not sufficient to allow the construction of the shield and the moving of the equipment um, under that. Uh, so for the portion of the bridge that is directly over Sligo Creek Parkway, um, the contractor has asked for a nighttime demolition. And they're talking about 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, they've identified four days where they want that demolition to take place. Um, <clears throat> the dates they're looking at are June 10th, June 27th and 28th, and July 1st. Um, the demolition would happen on the first three of those dates, the 10th, the 27th, and the 28th. On July 1st, they're actually going to be putting up some additional equipment so it wouldn't be uh, quite the noise uh, as you would have on the other three days. Um, our understanding, and I can read directly from there, memo. Um, they're going to remove the barrier wall on the first day. I think it'll take one shift and then they're going to demolish the beams over the road in two to three shifts. Um, and so they've made that formal request to State Highway. Um, when I first heard that it was strong concern um, because I, I can recall in the public meetings that State Highway had with the neighborhood this was issue was raised numerous times by residents and there wasn't any indication that there'd be nighttime work. Right. Of course that's one of those things where you, you plan it and they had it planned a certain way and the contractor is telling them that they're unable to uh, manage daytime demolition um, or they can manage daytime demolition. It'll just take 
a significant amount of time. So what they think they can do in three days at night uh, would take them 10, to 10 days to two weeks during the day um, and would also require the closure of Sligo Creek Parkway during that time. Um, in order to, to drop the, the bridge, they're going to be dropping it onto the roadway below, so they'll have uh, wooden mats and protection on the roadway, but the intention is to just demolish that section of the bridge directly on the road. Uh, so we're looking at a you know, combination of uh, bad to worse, I guess, in terms of um, the impact on the neighborhood. Uh, at this point, uh, State Highway hasn't formally responded, but we have been in communication with the project manager and relayed as many of the concerns as I've identified to date. I just wanted to make the council aware of it and um, find out what uh, else uh, you would like or, or think we need to do in order to either uh, understand further the conditions that require this request uh, and or facilitate the communication of this information to the community um, and also identify you know or ask for whether or not there's any alternatives or adjustments or other things that could be considered and, and added to the mix yeah one thing i'd like to add or clarify is that um, Sligo creek parkway is to be the detour route for the closure of the bridge. And so if you're not able to use Sligo Creek Parkway, the route that would be taken during that time for quite a few days is not what has been communicated with the neighborhood. So that's that's part of the balancing of this. Mm -hmm. Council Member Sunday. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Braithwaite, for the briefing. And this is bad and worse news uh, mm -hmm. regarding this project. Uh, is first off, I would like you to ask uh, SHA if there are any alternatives. I mean, if they're thinking out the box. I mean, is it does it have to be three days? Can they do it in two days? I mean, w w what other options do we have? Because I don't think anyone in the community is prepared for this type of construction to go on at night. Uh, the other thing is. Um, I would like us to do a full court press on getting the information out to the community, whether that is on social media, whether or not we have enough time to put it in the newsletter. Or, yeah. uh, we can do something on uh, city TV just so that we can get this information uh, to residents. Uh, and then the last piece, are we going to be, is there gonna, for the new traffic routes, is the state going to pay for all the signage or do we have to pay for that now because they've come up with this new route? How will that be taken care of? Well, uh, in regard to the planned detour route um, that's using Old Carroll, Sligo Creek Parkway, Maple, Maplewood, and right. Back to Flower, uh, everything related to that detour plan is um, the financial responsibility of, of the state, all the traffic signals, the marks, the road marks, the signs. Um, there was additional traffic calming measures that were identified through a uh, public process and the council endorsed and we have a list of those items that the city is going to do in addition to what the right. state is going to do so those are our costs that the city will incur it's primarily you know signage some stop signs at maple and maplewood and some other markings and um, uh, things of that nature so not particularly costly items we also have a list of potential other things that that the city may choose to do if the traffic impact is worse uh, or particularly badly felt in one part of the neighborhood so we have more costly items that the city would undertake in the event that those things became problematic so that's with the planned detour route with this new uh, Sligo Creek closure and the alternative detour route that that uh, necessitates uh, and the use of Old Carroll and Lincoln Avenues, any of the signage um, would be the requirement of Kewitt or State Highway to install. Uh, we're currently in kind of informal conversations with them about what that signage should look like. Um, we're strongly encouraging them to follow State Highway's mandates on the, you know, the State Highway has very uh, specific and explicit instructions related to signage requirements for traffic detour. So. We're basically um, hoping that State Highway meets all those uh, requirements and Qit you know, steps up and, and provides enough information to, to meet all those uh, requirements. Uh, in terms of notification, I think that's typically where these things tend to fall through. Uh, so if there is a role for the city to play, it's certainly in that, that 
that vein. Uh, that's what we can do. That's not what State Highway does well. That's not certainly what a Canadian construction company is going to be able to do well here in Maryland. Uh, so I think that's really the role for us. The question becomes sort of when do we start providing this notice? Is there, you know, does, is there more information that's needed before we're comfortable with that plan moving forward? Uh, and then at what point do we engage all our resources? You know, I'm not talking financial resources, just mostly smarts and social media and listservs and community activists to make sure that everybody is made aware. The good part is with the June, um, June dates and some very specific dates, we were very pleased to see they could nail down a date, an, an exact date. Uh, you know, people can have a lot of notice if in the event they can go somewhere else uh, they've certainly got many months' notice. For the daytime work that's being planned at the last week of March, not so much notice. There should, there's no noise impact. It's just going to be traffic mm -hmm. impacts, and the police can be made aware, and we can try to make sure that they do the best signage they can do um, and, and potentially try to help them think through the possible impacts on things like Jefferson Avenue, cut through traffic and stuff like that. If I may, uh, one of the things about notification, I immediately contacted the hospital because mm -hmm. the idea of nighttime work right next to the hospital with, you know, whatever the sound corridor would be down the creek um, with the hospital on the edge of the creek, um, you know, I think may give some extra leverage to, to not having that or at least to working with them. Um, and so I don't know if some of the back and forth that goes there um, will have an influence on if they're going to try the nighttime work or the, the longer daytime work. And so we can provide notice that these are the two options, but I'm not sure when a real decision is going to be made on which option they can go for. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I would like to see a drip campaign, you know, start off with some ideas and social media, letting people know that this is coming, uh, and then get real specific uh, the closer that it gets to uh, closing Carroll Avenue Bridge for uh, the nighttime work and, you know, closing it for the next 18 months. Uh, but start now so that residents know that this is going to be an issue, not just for Carroll Avenue, but for this new detour that no one thought was going to happen. And, and I know, you know, you have, uh, Ian had this conference or sat on a conference call. Was there anything else that was hinted by SHA that might be a potential problem down the road? Um, not that we're aware of or not that I'm aware of. I mean, the uh, meetings they have are actually at the um, in an office that State okay. Highway has. Um, so it's, it's not a phone conversation. And typically there can be a whole range of people from park and planning, State Highway, as well as CUIT. Um, just depends on, you know, what's come up in that particular week. We're still in the early stages. There's still a lot of prep, still dealing with utilities. A lot of it is just that kind of early or early stage preparation work. Any issues with the pedestrian bridge that's still mm -hmm. going to be built in mm -hmm. the spring? Mm -hmm. and yes, yes, that's um, been ordered and, and uh, will be installed. Um, they actually sped up the time frame for the ordering of that bridge because the CUIT was concerned that they may have to close Carroll Avenue, the bridge, sooner than originally intended because they're very concerned about the condition of the bridge. Um, and, and now that they're on site, it is their responsibility. Um, so if something should happen to the bridge, in addition to State Highway being liable, so would it. So they may um, push up the date but whereby they install the pedestrian bridge to, to um, close the close the bridge sooner rather than later. Right now, they're still looking at the June, um, a June time frame uh, for, for the actual closure. It, it may move up. Thank you, Ms. Braithwaite. Mm -hmm. Ms. Braithwaite, is there any way that we could um, see if they can change the March 21st to 25th delivery? Um, the reason I ask is because if they move it to the following week, that's spring break. Um, and that would just alleviate some of, you know, the traffic in the community without school buses. Um, if we cannot get them to move that to the following week, is there any way we could have them alter the times, 9 to 3.30, for closing it? If they do it later and then open it earlier, if they can condense it, again, would alleviate some problems for um, the school traffic. But the 9 to 3.30 is 
it's not ideal, especially for the elementary schools um, in the area. So if there's something on that that we could see if they could adjust it. We can certainly ask. Okay. Thank you. Um, Council Member Schultz. Um, I have four questions um, for you, uh, Ms. Braithwaite. Uh, I'm not clear as to what extent we have any say in the daytime versus the nighttime thing. Is Are they just telling us that this is something they're, th they're deciding and they haven't decided, or are they actually looking for us to make it, give them advice? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, my sense from the early discussions was that they were offering that as a statement of this is what they were requesting and we're surprised when they heard from us that whoa 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 uh, okay. roll it on back we got to talk about this um, so they're a little bit state highways a little bit sort of oh okay you want to talk about this all right um, you know now what what authority we have I mean they're asking to detour on our streets right. they need to go through us to provide that detour whether or not they go through the formal process, there's probably not a whole lot they can do. We can do, but mm -hmm. uh, we certainly hope that they coordinate with us and mm -hmm. and keep things uh, cordial. Uh, we also understand the challenge and the difficulty they face, so we don't want to be obstructionists. We want to facilitate their work. We just want to make sure that they're keeping the whole community in mind as they move okay. forward. Everybody's interested in getting this project started and finished as soon as possible. Um, Right. And uh, they do have genuine concerns about the safety of the bridge as it is now, so they're very interested in, in moving things forward as Good. quickly as possible. Uh, my second question is, could we, given that this closing, this, the, the second matter you're talking about, isn't until June 10th, approximately, uh, can we do a first-class mailing to all city residents or whether that would be at our expense or not, I think it would be very well worthwhile expenditure of city money, and hopefully maybe the SHA would uh, grace us with a reimbursement. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least that way, you know that everybody will have had an opportunity to be notified. Mm -hmm. um, We've the, asked State Highway to provide us their notification plan um, as a starting point. Mm -hmm. um, we can build on that. Yeah. Uh, third question is, how loud will the nighttime demolition be? Oh, yeah. That's and, pretty loud. And also the lights, because when they work at night, they have these lights that are just beyond brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Um, directly from their email, we will be using uh, excavator mounted excavator mounted hydraulic hammer and concrete pulverizer to take down the bridge rubber tire loaders and rubber tracks skid, skid steers will be used to load out the demo material uh, we'll be placing timber matting on the road in order to protect the road so you know concrete chunks of varying sizes will be being jackhammered uh, and, from and the bridge falling, and falling to the road below so you know i was thinking we might want to sell tickets because i think a lot of, of it will be quite an exciting thing to see i mean yeah. the, the you know too bad it'd be at night. I might not, I might not get any well, sleep. Hmm? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, well, I have light. I mean, we can put up stands. But anyway, my, my fourth question then is uh, contemplating a Lincoln Avenue detour, given the, the, the difficulty of any vehicle of any size making a turn off of Carroll onto Lincoln, uh, given the geometry of that, uh, of, of that intersection. I just don't see how that could possibly work with traffic flowing both directions through that intersection. And unless we can get permission to put up temporary stop signs on those days or have police officers on duty to, to manage traffic through that, it's going to be very difficult. Yes, well, um, you know, Carroll Avenue will be shut down. So there won't be traffic coming from the bridge. So that mm -hmm. takes out that portion of it. Yeah, um, the detour traffic that will normally be going around to Sligo Creek Parkway and to Flower will be funneled to, to Maple and Lincoln. Um, so some of the difficulty of that intersection will be addressed by the fact that there, you won't have traffic coming in one direction. 
Um, there okay. also okay. have I have requested no parking <clears throat> on that first section of Lincoln between uh, Carroll and Jefferson. Okay. So that'll provide. It's a narrow section of road, but it'll provide the maximum road width. Well, I'm to confident. Accommodate. You, I'm confident that you'll, you know. It's, figure it out. It's not ideal by far, but you know, when I started looking at the map and said, hmm, where else would you go? <laughs> uh, their first plan was to go up Jackson Avenue to Lincoln Avenue, and we said, no, 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 that, that, that can't work. Why can't you use Old Carroll? Everything's set up for Old Carroll. Mm -hmm. um, so they said, oh, yeah, we can use Old Carroll. So um, I, I don't see a better alternative, really, sadly, but uh, it, it will have an impact. Thank you. Councilmember Mayo. Thank you, Ms. Braithwaite, for being here. Um, I'm going to focus on the positive side, which is that you're telling us this in advance, and yeah. the SHA is telling you in advance. Okay. Um, I looked at the city's website, and we, we have a space that would be perfect for Ian to provide any information from his weekly calls. Uh, and I'd love to see us start using that on the initiative um, website. Uh, there's a little box on the right hand si left hand side, excuse me which is sort of current status. Okay. And it'd be perfect to put that there. And just a second, which is to say, whenever he does that on a weekly basis, ideally, if there's anything new, just emailing the council and saying, hey, we just updated the information, and then we can get that information out to constituents. Um, uh, just noting in passing that State Highways does not seem to have updated their project website, which we reference in some ways. Uh, it's, it's significantly out of date in at least some pieces of it, so that might be a request of State Highways. Um, but I appreciate their communicating to us. I appreciate that you are uh, staying on top of it, your department is staying on top of it, and that we're getting this information. And I agree with Councilmember Smith that just making sure that information gets back to the community is, is the piece that we should all help with. Um, I, uh, when they did the 410 resurfacing, there were days of, uh, I should say, nights and nights of yeah. nighttime work all night long. Um, lower priority, lower, lower safety risk project. So. I understand if they need to do three or four nights closure to get this, this thing done, and uh, that will have, I think, probably the most immediate effects on Ward 2 and Ward 3 residents who are right there on that, that side of the creek. Um, and so, again, if we can prepare people for the, the amount of noise, the amount of light, uh, and communicate why it's necessary, um, if SHA and the contractor can do their best to stay within that time limit, you know, if it's supposed to be three or four nights, it is three or four nights. Um, if it's not going to be three or four nights, letting us know in advance mm -hmm. instead of getting through the four nights of, you know, June, June and, the June and July nights that you indicated, and then, you know, all of a sudden it keeps going for right. two or three more days. That will help people have the peace of mind to know mm -hmm. that their lack of sleep is going to end at some point. Um, I know that was important, uh, and a failure of the 410 project uh, was that nighttime uh, noise went on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Uh, even when they were telling you that it was not going to, you know, like, we're done, and then sure enough, that night, there they were again. Um, it, just to clarify, the, the closure that results in the change, the temporary change in detour up Old Carroll and over to Lincoln and down, that was for the four-day period from March 21st to 25th to bring in heavy uh, equipment or supplies, correct? Yes, and also uh, with the nighttime demolition. Uh, oh, I see. So, the, so you'd have this four-day period with the, the change detour mm -hmm. uh, during the day. Right. Bef and the bridge is still open at that point. Right. The bridge is still so open. So there's a, there's a four-day march period. Bridge is open, but there's this detour on for... for yeah, uh, basically Sligo's going to be closed right. under the bridge. And so because um, Sligo Creek does not get a lot of very heavy vehicle traffic, you know, there aren't a lot of 18-wheelers that are supposed to be mm -hmm. on, on mm -hmm. Sligo, right. that detour should work relatively well for that period. And then uh, for the other periods, the June, June, July dates, the demolition dates, using that detour route again during those four or five nights, mm -hmm. that's where the, the detour could have some of the mm -hmm. right. um, traffic constraints, but where, again, there should be relatively mm -hmm. few nighttime large vehicles. You know, that should be time when there's no school buses, yep. not that many delivery vehicles that, at that time of night. Yeah, that um, is all factored into there decision to do make the request uh, and just one other flag which is that um, having and and the mayor spoke about this uh, with regard to spring break but the end of school you know the last day of school is the 17th or a couple days after that depending on when the last snow day factors in so if the bridge closure is slated to happen 
and it doesn't happen until the day after school uh, is out of session, that would be preferable to moving it up a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, I, I was encouraging that. But again, I'm, I'm if uh, I think just kind of gut reaction, if the choices are really stuck to 10 days of daytime work with much more significant traffic disruptions or three or four nights of nighttime work, um, I'm happy to try to explain that to constituents. Mm -hmm. Or I'm not happy to. But. <laughs> I was about to. You can do that. Yeah. <laughs> Councilmember Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you for giving us this information ahead of time. You know, as you know, that really helps. Um, I'm just a little confused because we spent a lot of time and, and a lot of community meetings to discuss uh, the detour plans for this project. And now the very first time we have a detour, it's an exception to the plans that were discussed. Um, is this it? I mean, are there going to be, have we discussed with the State Highway that uh, we would like to have opportunity ahead of time for these things in the future? Yeah, I think everybody's crystal balls are broken, so um, it's unknown. Um, I think it's one of those cases where the designers assumed that the shielding could be done over the entire length of the bridge, and once the contractor got on board, they uh, identified an area where it was unable to be done, so... And uh, then you mentioned that uh, now that the contractors are here and looking at what needs to be done and they're very concerned about the bridge, uh, should we be concerned about driving over the bridge? I don't know. Um, <laughs> at this point, State Highway has kept the bridge open. I'm sure, it, you know, one would hope that if they get to a point where they're worried about the safety of the bridge, they would close the bridge. But it's something they are watching uh, daily, really. It looks horrible mm -hmm. when you drive over. All right, thank you very much. Councilmember Koreshi. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Ms. Braithwaite. Um, I just want to echo my colleagues' comments on notice. I think notice is going to be key here. I would just ask you to also utilize us for that notice. We have our own listservs and people yeah. we dispatch information out to. You know, I used to do demolition work in college, and to me it was just putting on some Led Zeppelin and going to town. But... I think about some of my constituents who live along that bridge or near it, some of whom are very sensitive to sound already. And I think particularly the elderly and those with young children, it may be a good idea to also identify in advance uh, the elderly, whether through lifelong t Tacoma and other resources that we have to reach out to them because maybe, you know, conventional uh, uses of social media might not be something that they're tuned into. So I think that that would be very important. Um, what is the impact at all on the bus lines that go down um, in that direction? Are you aware of that at all? Uh, I would have to refamiliarize myself with buses on Sligo Creek Parkway. I don't know. Um, so they would obviously have to follow the detour route the same as the cars but we can get some more information about that yeah, i think that would be helpful yeah, my understanding was that the that the um, buses are to route to be rerouted at some of them on to cycle creek parkway so then they would have to follow that detour route yeah, okay. it'll be an interesting discussion um and the final question uh, two final things one it seems like you're referring to an email that you received from sha if that's something you could share with us that would be sure. really helpful mm -hmm. um and then finally, the question regarding signage, does the signage solely pertain to detour or does it also create no through traffic signs for certain blocks and areas? Um, That's part of what we're asking them to develop for us, uh, basically a detour sign plan which would identify any of those types of signs. They have talked about bringing in a, a um, message board <coughs> that is, um, uh, for Sligo Creek Parkway actually prior to the 21st to the 25th bridge closure, a message board is supposed to appear next week at Sligo Creek Parkway, probably at Maple, and then also near Old Carroll to notify drivers that the, that section of the parkway would be closed uh, during that following week. Um, but uh, we haven't seen any, any more detailed sign plans um, than that at this point. And I just, uh, I think about that because I know in detour situations, sometimes there's signage that comes in that says no through traffic to certain blocks. And that would be something that we could probably add to our notice to the community because I know that creates a traffic enforcement issue, thereby creating 
moving violations, which is another source of sort of concern for folks, and it's better if they know ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilmember Kovar. Thank you, Mayor. Just a few questions. Um, one, just curious, are they required to or are they exempt from uh, submitting the information under our noise ordinance? Just uh, wondering if they have to do that as regular people yeah, would. Yeah, I do not know. Um, I do Construction's not know. pretty much, I mean, exempt. there would have to be a noise plan as, as part of that, right. but it'll be interesting to see. Okay. With something like this, I mean, there's, sometimes you just have to live with it. All right, they should still maybe submit the plan anyway, yeah. though, right? Um, so you said the days for June 10th plus the 27th, 28th, and July 1st, is that mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so when, what time of day, like what's night versus Oh, uh, 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. So, and, and what are the pros and cons between what yeah. that gets you that you don't get if you do it the other way? Uh, if you don't uh, close Sligo Creek Parkway at night for them to drop the bridge on during those days, they will have to maintain Sligo Creek Parkway open and do the demolition during the day. Um, actually, they'll have to do the demolition during the day and still close Sligo Creek Parkway, so you'll still have the detour, whether it's daytime or nighttime, both for Carroll Avenue and for Sligo Creek Parkway. It'll just be a slower process um, during the day than they'll be able to and do at night. Why is it slower? I think they're planning, uh, you know, all hands on deck, a major... Uh, major demo party with their equipment. Uh, and there's, you know, less traffic and less, less but things I guess to I'm with. if they're closing it anyway, why does the tra traffic matter? Or is it this less disruptive to traffic going somewhere else? So, I mean, why can't they do all hands on deck in a day and just do it so it doesn't disturb people? I, I don't have the answer to that question. This is just what we've been told from the contractor themselves. We can ask them to clarify. Be good to, it would be good mm -hmm. to know that. Um, and the last thing is, I guess, only one of those days is when school is in session, June 10th. So, presumably, there's no impact on on buses or anything like that, or school activities because it's pretty late. I guess is that the would, would that be the idea? Uh, with June 10th, I mean, why June 10th? I I don't know. They have a construction schedule that they've yeah. set up, and that's the date that okay. they want to. But I guess I think they'll be ready to start demolition. I think for me, just understanding what you really get by doing it at night would be mm -hmm. worthwhile. Thanks. Great. Thank you. I just want to reiterate what my colleague said. I think getting information out um, to the public as soon as possible. Um, June 11th is actually the ACT test for um, any <laughs> high school student in the area. Uh, it's not the SAT, but the ACT. So having a heads up um, sooner rather than later is probably um, a good thing if that is a potential date. And also, do you know, um, and maybe this is something we can take on as a city, is also just alerting um, the school administration uh, at Piney Branch, uh, Tacoma Middle, and Tacoma Park Elementary um, about this, especially if we are unsuccessful in seeing if they can move uh, the March 21st to 25th dates. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, being the uh, bearer of this news. Yeah. And, and oh, you got one, one more time. Quick mm -hmm. ask. Which is, I mean, could it, would it be possible to provide just sort of a one-page written update and send it to our state delegation or state and county? Just informational, not no, mm -hmm. re no request needed, but, you know, this is what we know of the project yeah. and how the project is changing just a little bit, and this is an official mm -hmm. information per se, but uh, makes it easier for us to ask them for help later on. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll work with Susie on that. Great. Thank you. And I uh, give our thanks to Mr. Chamberlain as well for his work oh. on this. All right. Now we'll move to our voting session. The first item we have is a second reading ordinance amending the Tacoma Park City Code, Chapter 10.12, private collection for multifamily facilities to change the date for filing an annual report. I do not believe there's been any changes since the first reading, so uh, would anyone like to move this, please? So no. Council Member Mail moving, second, second by Council Member Qureshi. Any discussion of this? No? Is a second reading ordinance? Can I do? Yep, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Councilmember Schultz? Aye. Councilmember Qureshi? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Mail? Yes. Councilmember Siemens? Aye. Councilmember Kovar? Yes. Mayor Stewart? Yes. Right. Just for the record, is it I or yes? Whatever moves you. We. Oui. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. 
Hey, we uh, put on the ordinance itself the uh, eyes and nays, but. Okay, thank you. Some people don't wear ties either. <laughs> All right, the next voting item. First reading ordinance amending the Tacoma Park Code, Chapter 16.08, excuse me, stormwater management fee system. Um, any comments on that? The city manager had a This simply, um, this simply um, puts in the code the way that we have handled uh, condominium units when there's not a condominium association. Okay. Great. Anyone would like to move this one? So moved. Council Member Smith, Council Member Schultz seconded. Any discussion or questions? I actually have a question to the mm -hmm. city manager that yes. I emailed you about today. I know it doesn't pertain ah. to what we're doing here. If you could just raise that because some members of the community were interested sure. as to why it's a fee and not a tax. Sure. Um, the city uses stormwater management fee so that all users of the stormwater system actually pay into that, whether they're a tax paying entity or a nonprofit. Um, because we have hospital, colleges, um, that schools that would otherwise not um, pay taxes. Uh, this way they are, and they m have many of the larger parking lots and things with impermeable, impermeable surfaces. Um, it helps them to more fairly share the um, costs of us running the stormwater management system. Um, one thing, many places do have it as part of the tax, um, as the email that you mentioned um, referenced, um, when that's the case, it can be written off as property taxes can be written off for people who um, pay taxes and, and do the, um, you know, the full process. But uh, we found that for Tacoma Park, it made more sense to do the fee and have everyone cover. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor of the ordinance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right. Moving on to our third voting item, single reading ordinance authorizing the purchase of energy efficient windows for the community center third floor. Uh, this is an item um, that um, we're really looking forward to. If you go up to our third floor, kind of the back windows uh, on a cold day, you will see staff wearing gloves and hats and scarves. Uh, clearly, it's not an energy efficient uh, situation. Um, we do have a, um, a good price for replacement windows that have the Energy Star rating, and we'd like to move forward with the replacement. Would anyone like to move this ordinance? So moved. Councilmember Siemens, Councilmember Schultz seconding. Any questions? Councilmember Kovar? Can you just clarify? Uh, is there something about these windows that the rest of the windows in the building are not yeah, they're, like they're, for some reason? They're different. They're a different style. Uh, some of the other windows have been replaced over time, but this is a whole stretch of this particular style of window that was original to the to the back of the building. So the other, but the, this doesn't need to be done like throughout the building at this stage, as far as the other ones are different kinds of windows, and okay. we've we've not found the same kind of issues. Okay. Any other questions? This is a single reading ordinance. Do we need a roll call? Councilmember Kovar? Yay. <laughs> Councilmember <laughs> Council Siemens? Aye. Councilmember Mail? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Qureshi? Aye. Councilmember Schultz? Aye. Mayor Stewart? Aye. All right, those are our voting items. We will move on now to our work session. Our first work session is a briefing on the additional information compiled on the library renovation project and discussion of approach to obtain additional public comment. So this evening we are just talking about the information that has been uh, compiled and what other information we would like. Um, so what we're not taking up tonight <laughs> is a discussion of pros and cons of different concepts, um, but rather what other questions we may have or information available. I believe the city manager has provided each of us at our place uh, what will be up or is, is it's, it is it is on the it is on the website now on the on the um, kind of project inventory website under library renovation um, there's a, a much better organized listing of the um, background information on um, the different studies that have been done to date regarding the library renovation project, um, links to the videos of the public meetings that have been held, um, reports that have been prepared. 
Um, we also have um, this, which I passed out to you, which um, goes to some of the questions that the council members had asked for before, which is a listing of different kinds of options, what the square footage comparisons are, the price comparisons are, um, what this means, um, kind of if there's some interesting um, pros and cons about the different options, um, also some kind of incremental spaces if you want um, an additional courtyard or deck or whatever. And on the, there's design options that are keyed to each of these um, that are in the chart so that you have a way to kind of look visually at what the footprint of the various options would be. Um, and <clears throat> the, we also have already online a public comment form, very similar to the one that we had originally with the Tacoma Junction project, where people can um, enter their comments online. Uh, we will be having a visualization, a computer generated visualization of the interior of the building um, that would kind of give a sense about how, how many books there are, kind of seating areas, kind of how a place would be used, what the light would look like, that kind of thing. Um, and so um, this is information that we would like to encourage. I know many of you already have encouraged uh, your residents to look at these options and make comments. Um, at this point, I'd like to know if there's anything else um, about kind of how we get public comment or if there's some any additional information that should be on the website on this so that we can make sure that we have it all together. Councilmember Mail. Um, just a couple of comments. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is helpful. Um, did you say this is already on the website? Or? It's, uh, yes, it's it's just gotten up. And yeah. both on the city council website and then on the library renovation project website. I'm not sure if it's, it's not on the city okay. council website. Great. Um, this set of diagrams mm -hmm. would be really helpful as a PowerPoint on the website, uh, either website, um, but with one slide per design so people can see the detail. Okay. Um, you just described, I think, that there would be some sort of projections of the um, book space. Mm -hmm. I did a, a survey of Ward 2 residents and um, the things that people have the strongest views, strongest support for, that they, that they rated the strongest, were um, e-books, uh, new books, more books, uh, and just simply renovate the space, mm -hmm. no, like no changes. Not indicating they didn't need anything new, they just wanted it to be shinier. Mm -hmm. um, so, but clearly books and e-books are important. Just, so just for people understanding what the space would, mm -hmm. how it would uh, make room for that okay. is important. Um, so those would all be useful for me. Um, I'm going to stop there. I might have more comments later. Okay. Nobody else wants to? Uh, I guess okay. I have Council Member Crazy? If you're asking, Mayor, I'll, I'll say okay. something. Um, I missed this maybe. Is there, is there going to be a mechanism to provide online comments as well? Yes, that, that okay. is already now on the website. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Councilmember Kovar? Yeah, it's really useful to have these 12 different options. It, even they, though, don't necessarily cover you know, every conceivable combination. So I guess That's the right. only question I had is that if people look at those and sort of say, well, I like eight, but part of nine, which doesn't get rid of the trees or whatever. Is there some way to kind of, if we get some of those that appear to be, you know, legitimate alternatives too, that we could maybe ask the architect to calculate that out too? Uh, I, I don't want it to be an endless array of all the permutations, but I'm just wondering if that's, uh, Well, I think, you know, you know, obviously we can't do an endless array, but right. I would very much encourage people to use the online form mm -hmm. and say, exactly that. I, I really like option seven plus X or okay. minus this or if the light does that. Mm -hmm. That kind of, those kind of comments are really helpful. Okay. Um, and then it's going to end up coming back to kind of looking at what those comments are and seeing is are there a couple, maybe one or two more permutations that make sense to bring back to the council and the community, um, you know, that might address an issue that a number of people raise. Okay. 
Councilman Kovar, was there anything that you see that you would like to see in addition to this before? I, I, don't, think, I don't think we, I mean, stage? I may have my own views, but I don't think we need to add one right okay. now. Um, I just think eight and nine, there's a middle ground between eight and nine that does both of those things that um, would probably cost somewhere, you know, in between that. So, Councilman Schultz. You know, our audience doesn't have the benefit of being able to see, I don't think, what we're looking at right now. Is that correct? Right. So I would just say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hold it up. Uh, but it is online. Yeah. Turn on my microphone. Oh okay. My gosh, that did it. Wow, I've never been able to be this loud before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited with the possibilities. Um, th that you've got 12 different op uh, options uh, uh, broken down by square feet, construction costs, usable square feet, and effective costs of those of the usable square feet. And in my experience, I've never seen any any project designer come up with this kind of an array of data for the benefit of uh, users. This is uh, really nice, Re really nice that that, uh, that the architect, Mr. Luke Mark, would, could, could do this and was agreeable to, to putting out this information. And what you'll see is that while there could be other takeoffs on these permutations, uh, undoubtedly, that there's a lot of differences in terms of costs, overall costs and costs per square foot. So I don't think anybody will have much difficulty sort of interpolating some variations on these in, in their, by, by just looking in, at, at what you see here and learn from, from it. Uh, so it's between the most expensive and the least expensive, there's a huge difference. Uh, so I think this is good, and I, and I really very much appreciate the architect uh, helping us with this. That's all I wanted to say. Councilmember Siemens. Thank you. Um, you know, when I look at this real quick, the design options, um, I would like to add one, but I'm willing to throw one out to, so we end up with 12 still. <laughs> uh, and I, I really don't think uh, that, you know, building out all the way out to Philadelphia Avenue is, uh, is desirable or would be acceptable to the community. But I do like the two-story option, and I would like to see a, a number eight that is uh, two-story, uh, something that is uh, retaining the trees uh, but builds out to the maximum we can up to two stories. That's all. Thank you. I can, if, if, uh, what I can do for that um, is check. There may be a way to come up with kind of a, an 8A or something that right. um, uses that same diagram same but, has the, but has right. the costs that would be associated with a two-story. Thank you. Councilmember Mail. Uh, two additional things that would be helpful to have information on. Mm -hmm. um, the first is a let's say over a 10 year period projected staff uh, cost increase beyond baseline, which is current staff. Now I think that based on what we've heard before, that's primarily associated with a, a two second story floor. library mm -hmm. and the costs needed to have somebody on staff in the second story. But you know, if uh, our librarian and Mr. Buchmeyer believe that there are other designs here that would create um, a space that okay. was isolated that would need staffing. Okay. Then just just projecting that out and not just the one year but the ten year, so okay. we get a sense of you know what's going to be a significant cost. Um, similarly, on energy, so uh, elevators or uh, I don't know any of the other major designs here that they, they create a significant other basic sort of maintenance costs, energy use costs, sort of operations issues mm -hmm. would be helpful to know. Okay. Um, and that one may be harder, so I, I am less, uh, that's less, less critical to me, and I'm assuming it's a smaller range. It may be something that isn't um, quite as specific, but there could be some general sense of magnitude. Yeah. Okay. okay. Councilmember Smith. Uh, thank you for uh, the additional information. One piece that I would like to see is if we could get a breakdown of what the debt service would be right now if we went to the market to get a bond so that taxpayers would know what, 
how much we'd have to pay monthly, quarterly to service any of these projects, whether it's $1.4 million or I guess the highest is $11.9 million, so that people can get a real grasp of uh, what this is going to cost and, you know, if we need to consider increasing taxes to make this happen. I see. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Crushy. I guess uh, another thing that would be helpful is just to see, and maybe this is on the website already, is that between these different designs, what is the projected work sort of timeline? Um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I don't if, think that's there, but that's a good yeah. question. Yeah, I think just, you know, if you go with a certain option, how long will it take? How long will the city's library be out of commission? And what kind of impact would it have on the community in terms okay. of time? Anything else at this time? Before moving on from this, um, we are scheduled um, to go and have a work session on this on April 13th. So today is March 9th. I'd imagine it'll take a, a little bit to get, to get all get of the this rest of this information. Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll have to see if that's a if that's a reasonable time or not. Mm -hmm. um, is, are the, I guess asking my colleagues, are there other things other than the work session we have scheduled for April 13th they would like to see happen between now and then? Those nice little models with the little doors you can open. <laughs> We're getting the How visual. much money you get? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to get the video. It's yeah. like Property Brothers. <laughs> for those of us who didn't get to do it before, and I don't speak for my other new colleague on this, but you talked, or someone talked about standing on the site and kind of seeing where these things would come out to. Okay. Um, I wouldn't ask everybody to do that if we've done that before, but if, if we could, if those of us who wanted to again. could just do that, mm -hmm. I would find it helpful anyway. No, I think that would be great. I, w I would second that. And, you know, for the, in the interest of full disclosure, my Ward 3 residents known this, that since our last meeting, Mr. or Councilmember Kovar, Councilmember Schultz and Ms. Ludlow and I had an opportunity to meet with the architect and go through these permutations in very, very exact detail. And I think that that, because it was the time of night, it may make sense to do that with to, him or to be able to go outside. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe we could do that um, prior to a city council meeting, and mm -hmm. then invite members of the public if they'd like to yeah. attend that as well. So when. I have my meeting with the city staff regarding agenda items. We can look at a good time. And considering that we changed the clocks this weekend, um, it will be light out later. So uh, we'll maybe be able to do that before a council meeting before April 13th. That'd be great. Okay. All right. Thank then I think much. we will move on from this. Um, thank you to the staff for pulling together this information. Uh, now we are. Going to our city tax revenue sources, our taxes 101. All right. Get my act together here. One of the things that um, is actually kind of fun. Is, is learning how taxes work. Uh, and I hope I convey that fun today. <laughs> I don't think anyone's ever said that before. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I was thinking about before doing this is that um, the good thing about municipal taxes is you see where they go. There, this people pick up your trash, the potholes get filled, the stop signs get put in, the police are there. Um, compared to state and federal taxes where you're not really sure what it all gets spent on. This is, this is something you can see and you actually know the exact people you can complain to mm -hmm. <laughs> about them. And, and so there's something that's very real about that. Uh, so I put together a, um, an overview of um, different taxes as they affect Tacoma Park. And so I'll be going through uh, real property tax revenue, the assessable base, the constant yield tax rate, the relationship between an assessment and the amount the an owner will pay in taxes. I, like, I owe how much? Uh, other kinds of property taxes, income taxes, 
and tax duplication. The revenue for city services um, comes from um, a whole lot of tax. The percentage is very high for taxes. Um, for municipalities in Maryland, property taxes are one of the few things that we actually can uh, use to pay for services. About 93% of our general fund, and this is for general fund, 93% um, of our revenue come from taxes and intergovernmental transfers. Of this, 51% is property tax, and about 15% is income tax. In the current year, real property tax revenue is estimated to be $11.37 million, comprises, as I said, about 51% of the general fund revenue. Um, the estimate that we get for this um, general fund revenue is based on the net assessable real property base, which the state has said is about $1.9 billion of Tacoma Park. That information was provided to us in February of 2015, and we multiply it by the tax rate that was set by the City Council of um, 58.5 cents per $100 assessed value. And I want to note that a lot of estimating goes into the assessments that are prepared by the State Department of Assessment and Taxation, known as SDAT or SDAT. SDAT assesses each property once every three years, um, so the state does a third of the properties each year. The goal is that taxes are applied fairly as individual property values change over time. All of Tacoma Park is in one assessment district. Uh, the assessments that just came out were done in late fall of 2015, and then you know, three years before that and three years before that. I'm sorry, Ms. Lilly, just to, just to be clear, SDAT does one one third of properties each year, but in the city, we're all done. We are, that's correct. Okay. Right. Um, most counties are actually divided into thirds, but our our city is uh, wholly within one of those um, time periods. And why is that? It's just the way the lines were drawn. Sometime. <laughs> I, there's any potential change in it? I have thought about sense? that, but I think it might shake people up too. So. <laughs> Um, so there are pros and cons. There's pros and cons. So the state not only assesses the current value, but it also looks at the expected or the improved values of properties. And they look at current sales prices, kind of what, what are the house sales on a street uh, or commercial property sales. They also look at permits, what permits are out there, and they make the guesses of the actual value of the properties once the um, improvements have been done. And they are very clear that they don't use the value that people fill out on their permit applications. People put, oh, it's only going to cost $20,000 or something uh, because they think that will get them a lower tax rate, but that's not what they look at. To get to the net assessable base, the state averages that um, a, the increased value. So if you've got a house and it was um, assessed at 350000 and then the next time it was assessed at 400000 they take that 50000 and they spread it over three years. Um, if the, um, if then there's credits and abatements that are applied, and I'll go through that in a moment. One of the things that we have found is that when property values increase significantly, um, the first year has a lot of uh, credits and abatements, and that makes sense. If all of a sudden you've got this new uh, amount value for your property, and what? Um, more people challenge it, um, or uh, a number of credits come into play. So there's here's some of the credits that come into play in Maryland. There's a homeowner's property tax credit. Residents can um, file, apply each year through the state lower income homeowners um, are able to get credits um, that affect the assessed value uh, for taxing purposes for their property. F Tacoma Park matches the credit. Uh, the county also matches some of the credit. There's a homestead tax credit and this is something that um, if you own your home and you live in it, uh, you should make sure that you are shown that you are the homeowner and living there 
and have the homestead tax credit on your record because it limits the increased um, assessment for purpose of taxation to a 10% cap each year. Um, and there's just a one-time application for that, but there's still people who have not done that. Um, if you've just moved into a home, you don't get it for the first year, but then you need to know to apply. Um, there's a senior property tax credit. The Montgomery County does give a credit for residents who are 65 years and older, old and older. Um, but those people have to go through the homeowner's property tax credit process for that. Um, there's a few other different kinds of credits, and it's very confusing. Um, the thing that seems to be um, a standard, though, is if you think you might need a tax credit, apply for the homeowner's tax property tax credit uh, because something might be there to help you. And the percentage of our tax base, how many people use these tax credits? Um, well, this year we gave, um, we matched 134 households. Can I just mm -hmm. ask a question? Yeah. Um, can you go back? So the homestead tax credit limits assessments, assessments to a 10% increase. That's here. right. That's different from the tax rate that is also capped. The, ta the tax rate is not capped, but it's, it's your tax rate is multiplied by your assessment. So there is an ass assessment for tax purposes that is lower than what the real value of your property is based on these processes. And that can't go up by more than 10% each right. year? That's right. That's right. But even though your house could be worth substantially more. more than that, right? I think it was, I think it was nine years ago when, when the properties went up a lot. Uh, my house doubled in value. And I was really glad at the 10% increase a year. So they assessed it as doubling in value. But they but, the, but for taxing purposes, it only went up 10% a year for the portion that is multiplied with the property tax rate. Um, for abatements, owners can appeal a property assessment. Um, what is found is that owners of commercial and multifamily properties are more likely to apply for abatements. Um, they often are more successful because there's different ways of calculating what the right value is of these properties. And an abatement has a bigger impact on the overall tax base because just of the larger value of those properties. Abatements come, are decided on after they send out the net assessable base information to the communities. And you'll see the importance of that in a moment. <clears throat> Um, every just about um, Valentine's Day, the city gets a constant yield tax rate form um, that where the state has estimated the amount of real property tax revenue that the jurisdiction will receive in the current year. And then they divide the current year's estimated revenue amount by the next year's estimated net assessable base to get the constant yield tax rate. Essentially, this is saying that if you they want to know what would the tax rate need to be to get just the same amount of revenue in the following year. If the constant yield tax rate is less than the current year's tax rate, then a public hearing is required, special notices are required. Um, if you think that you might be um, having a tax rate that is greater than the constant yield tax rate. If the constant yield tax rate is more than the current year's tax rate, then no special hearing or notice is required, no matter what rate will be proposed. And that's affected us last year and the year before. I think at least one year um, where we, because our property values actually went down. And this is the form that we get. Okay, that, mm -hmm. So even if you were going to increase it, the tax it, rate? Yes. You would, I mean, we probably would have a hearing anyway. We do, we, yeah. you know, as, as because we're good people, we have okay, the hearing. But I think it's really kind of, I just, I remember questioning the person at yeah. the state. So we don't have to advertise that we're <laughs> going to have this tax rate that would go up. Um, but they're more concerned about conveying information to the property pay, taxpayers that even though perhaps the rate looks like it's staying the same, that they'd pay out more money because the assessments have gone up. So this is the form that we get every year, and I'm not going to go through it because this is 
Taxes 101, and this would be the graduate seminar. Um, but the, this is the computation that is done by the state, and things that are in it are interesting. Line two is an estimate of the homestead tax credit. Here, the estimate for the coming year was only 100, for this current year, is only $157,000. The previous year, it was um, about 10 times that. I mean, so it's just a remarkable difference that they, that they have. Yes? Sorry, I'm stepping us back a little bit, but uh -huh. for example, on many property tax bills, it says county property tax credit? Right. What does that refer to? Um, the county property tax credit is usually 692 the last couple mm -hmm. of years. Um, is a special amount that the Montgomery County decided to um, provide people who live in their homes. And so it's just an extra credit. It does not go to the assessment. It just comes straight off of the tax bill. Do you have to apply for it? No. It's done um, every year. I mean, it's done automatically. Now, um, Ike Leggett has indicated that he's going to raise taxes, uh, going to propose to raise taxes this year. I don't know. I was wondering, does that mean that he would increase the tax rate but continue this county tax credit, or is there some other mix? And so uh, he proposes his, um, his uh, budget on March 15th, so we'll see very soon. What's this? One of the things that this does, um, the lines um, kind of seven and eight, which talk about new construction and uh, full year new construction, there's the actual assessment work is done quite a bit earlier than when this is to apply and for, and so um, as of January 1. And so what they do is make a lot of estimates about how much construction they anticipate. And they, uh, the folks actually look at things. Last year, even, they were looking at what would Tacoma Junction development do. I mean, so they look in the future and try to make some estimates about what the impacts are on property um, assessments. The, um, what this does then is to, for this coming year, they've said that the amount of property tax revenue that we are to get with our tax rate of 58.5 cents per $100 valuation is $11,587,300. And in order to get that same amount of revenue next year, our tax rate should be 55.18 cents. They're not always right. Um, so one of the things that I have noticed is that um, you know, sometimes they're good at, at judging the assessable base and sometimes they're not. For FY13, they were almost spot on, only $5,200 difference from their estimate and the amount that we actually received as shown in our CAFR. Um, in FY14, uh, they overestimated and we got $57,000 less than was predicted. Last year, we had $128,000 less than was predicted by the state in terms of income tax, uh, in, in property tax revenue. And that's uh, two-thirds of a cent of our property tax rate. So they were, so their assessable base estimate was, was quite off from what we actually netted uh, as property tax revenue. And do you understand why you have this trend line of them being off? No, I don't. Um, I think, you know, everybody's trying to figure out how our assessable base is, is changing. And, and what, per, what percent were they off by? Well, the, uh, uh, what percent of our total uh, amount? Um, actually, I'd have to figure that one out. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but the, you know, obviously $128,000 to us is, is big money. Mm -hmm. So how much will somebody's tax bill be? Um, <clears throat> so a property owner receives a triennial assessment of the property that was received in December, I think, for most people in this area. The amount of any increase will be divided over a three-year period. If the property owner has a homestead tax credit, that's for the homeowners, the maximum increase in any year is 10%. And then you get uh, this result is the assessment value for taxing purposes. 
<clears throat> in Tacoma Park, a property owner pays the following property taxes. <clears throat> they have a, a state property tax, which has stayed at that 11.2 cents for years and years. The county, which is a combined that includes a number of different um, things, including the transit tax and the fire tax and a recreation tax, <clears throat> is 92 cents. Uh, park and planning, it's 7.4 cents. And the city of Tacoma Park is 58.5 cents. Altogether, <clears throat> for every $100 of assessed value, a property owner would pay, if there weren't any credits, um, $1.69 per $100 assessed value. <clears throat> so the tax rates are applied to the assessment for the applicable year on the assessment notice. Without any um, kind of changes, if your property is valued at $400,000 for tax purposes, if your assessable assessment for the year is $400,000, you'd pay $6,773 in taxes, and that's combined taxes with the county and the city. Then any other applicable credits would be applied, so the amount to pay could be less. Um, as I mentioned, we pay rebates to those with homeowner tax credits, and those people often uh, receive a check that um, brings the amount that they have to pay down to zero dollars. Um, this year, we, well, each year we set aside about $160,000 in our budget for this category. Um, this year, because we didn't have as many people who um, needed that assistance, were qualified for that assistance, 134 homeowners received checks and the amount totaled $116,000. Last year, the amount totaled $133,000 uh, for 142 homeowners. I anticipate the next year there'll be quite a few more. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how does one get eligible for that? What's the you filled out the form, the state form, um, and, you've, and is, if you have um, gotten credit for that, we simply use the state's listing of the people. Is it income-based? It is income-based, okay. yeah. So if you're below adjusted income or whatever, a certain level, and the state authorizes that, approves it, then we add our part to That's it. That's right. There are some criteria about how much of the value of the house applies, and, and so it's not, a, it's not quite as simple as that. Mm -hmm. But we do encourage people to at least try for it. And I give you... Um, here's one example from the state records of a particular property. This one is on, from Sligo Mill Road in Ward 3. Um, this past year, their um, assessment was $436,600. But their new statement said, oh, your property is now assessed at $605,400. Um, however, the amount that they will be taxed on is in the far right column, the 492867 And another example of how this works, and that's not counting in the credit that Councilmember Mail mentioned that the county would put on and that kind of thing. Um, this particular house um, is a property on Kennebec, Ward 6. Um, the value was $290,700. Um, the new value, $404,200. The amount that they have to pay taxes on is on the far right, three hundred and twenty-eight thousand five thirty-three. You sure, that's worth six or worth five. Um, actually, yeah, it was Kennebec. I'm sorry. That's okay. So, of the money, if, say this property that's um, assessed at uh, four hundred thousand dollars, and the property owners pay six thousand seven hundred seventy-three dollars in property taxes. Uh, the city of Tacoma Park would get $2,340. The um, county gets the bulk of it, which is $3,688. Park and planning gets $297. The state gets $448. Yes. So how is the money transmitted to us? Does it go through the county? It goes through the county. And then comes to us rather than from the state directly to us? That's right. It goes from the county. The right. county sends out the tax bills right. and collects the money and, and then transfers our portion back. Um, as I note here, some of the Montgomery County money is also returned to us as tax duplication payments. 
about half of Montgomery County's taxes goes to MCPS for the school district. Could I just ask another question? Mm -hmm. Sure. But the, it's all really collected by the state, right? So does the, the property taxes are sent out by the, the, the property taxes are collected by the county. But it's on your, I uh, say so you send it separately. You don't send it on your income tax, right? You, it's, not yeah. it's not the same as income tax. Right. And, you know, one of the things that, that many people don't quite realize about property taxes, many times it's paid by the mortgage company. Mm -hmm. So you never see it. It's part of, you know, it's mortgage it's bill. There's a certain amount out of it. Um, the people for whom I feel um, get hit the hardest and, and are impacted the most by um, property tax bills are people who've already paid off their house. Mm -hmm. And so it tends to be elderly. Um, that's part of the reason that there's some special programs for people who are lower income or that are elderly um, to help give some credits um, for those people who, for whom this is a, a bigger hit. The assessments for properties in Tacoma Park with the latest triennial assessment show an increase in value overall of about 25 percent. Um, but after reductions for the three-year averaging, the credits, and the abasements, abatements, um, the increase for taxing purposes is just 6% for the coming year. As I mentioned, we'll likely pay more in our match to the homeowner's tax credit. And I believe that um, the increase, actually I should say increase for FY18 for the city is likely to be greater than 6% because you will have uh, dealt with already with the abatements. Most people will have figured that out it's a little bit easier to make the assessment uh, to figure out what the accessible base is. So we have some other property taxes. We have um, for businesses personal property tax and if people move from other states they get confused because many places people pay personal property taxes as well as real property taxes. In Maryland this is for businesses and we have a different tax rate. We have a $1.55 per hundred dollars. Uh, we net just $353,500 for, from that um, tax. Personal property tax um, comes is assessed on two things, and not all jurisdictions assess for both. Um, personal property are furniture, fixtures, tools, um, equipment that's not used for manufacturing or for research and development. And then there's inventory, which is the average monthly value of products for sale. We also have a railroads and public utilities tax at $1.57 per $100, yielding $196,250. Yes. Could we just go back to the inventory mm -hmm. tax? Yep. So, I'm sorry. Um, no, lots of people have raised inventory taxes. In so can you explain how that works? Because as I understood it when I was talking to some people in the business district that we have a lot of flexibility in where we set that percentage? We, we have, um, I, I don't know the full answer. We certainly have a lot of flexibility in what the tax rate is for personal property tax. We can choose to tax inventory or not. I don't know, I think some places have a way that they do a percentage of the inventory, but I'm not very familiar with that option. Um, Montgomery County doesn't tax inventory. Um, some jurisdictions don't. And so it has been something that um, people complain about. Can I? Do you, uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was just going to ask, do you know of the 353,000, how much is I don't know. If, I don't know how that breaks out. Just to maybe point out the obvious is that some businesses have great deal of inventory, mm -hmm. like a retail mm -hmm. business right. and other businesses, like a law office, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or a real estate agency, or there's plenty of different things, have zero inventory. Right. So the inventory tax is a burden carried basically by uh, businesses that have inventory. So I don't know, it's just, I'm not just, it's just something that needs to be noted. Right. And my understanding is that businesses have to fill out this form and send it in that lists all of this information of whether or not they're taxed on it. 
Now we can come to income tax. Can I just ask yes. one clarification? So, mm -hmm. for example, the um, solar installer that was seeking a zoning um, exemption mm -hmm. in Ward 3, they would have an inventory of solar panels in their building, and that would be taxed just the same as a retail product, let's say the stuff in Mark's Kitchen, which is right there for a uh, consumer retail customer. Mm -hmm. Those would both be I inventory. think so. I am, not, I am not an expert on inventory tax. Um, I was reading the, you know, what the forms have that you file with the state, and um, I would think that, that the solar panels, because they're a product that are so, is sold, um, do we, would, do we get the information on which businesses pay that tax, or do we know? We get a cryptic report monthly, okay. and it's, I will say it's cryptic because there's, there is a, um, an assumption that if you're a business, you pay at least a certain amount, and they kind of like charge at a high rate until you say, no, here's the real information, and then they rebate it lower. And so most of the reports that we get are the credits that come through, so it's really hard to understand. That's not to say that we might not be able to get somebody to run something for us, but the information that we get is very difficult to understand. I, I'd like to see if we could get, mm -hmm. a, I'm not questioning your knowledge of it, but to get a You should question my clear knowledge. Clear understanding. <laughs> It'd be good. Sure. I'll see if I can get a report. Okay. okay now income taxes. Tacoma Park receives 17% of the state income tax that's, that is paid by Tacoma Park residents that would otherwise go to Montgomery County. Income tax revenue accounts for about 15% of the city's general fund revenue. And in recent years, we've gotten between $2.4 million to $2.8 million in income tax revenue. Income tax revenue is hard to estimate. Um, it varies due to economic conditions. And most of the um, incoming revenue from income tax comes after the budget's prepared um, for the next year. So you really you're guessing at what the numbers are, um, even for the current year. However, Tacoma Park's income tax has been more stable than Montgomery County's because we don't have um, a lot of rich people that have the variability of capital gains um, taxes. And um, that's been useful for us. It also means that I cannot use Montgomery County's system for estimating income tax. I've had to come up with... Uh, my own version. We've had a couple in income tax problems. Um, there's the Wynn decision that was a Supreme Court decision. <clears throat> Maryland lost the Supreme Court case. Um, it's requiring income tax refunds to many residents, particularly in Montgomery County. These are people who had to pay income to uh, multiple, who earned income from multiple jurisdictions. Um, we had very little impact from the Wynn case. Um, we are to refund about $40,000 to people for win case um, decisions. <clears throat> the way that this works is that the, um, the state will take a, out of our income tax um, payment a total of $40,000 over time. <clears throat> That's something we do get directly from the state is the income tax payments. However, the Comptroller's Office did not correctly distribute income tax revenue to the jurisdictions. Um, they completely did not pay attention to the addresses on the income tax forms for determining where income tax revenue goes. And the, the issue with this is that when a person fills out a state of Maryland income tax form, it asks you for your county, and you put that number in, that indication, and then it says if you're in a municipality, you identify that municipality. Some people don't put something there because they think that'll mean more income tax gets taken out, which isn't the case. The amount that the municipalities gets comes from the amount that would otherwise go to the county. Some people don't know. Some people put the wrong thing because they think they're in a municipality and they're not. Um, some people in the Chevy Chases put Chevy Chase and they don't say village of Chevy Chase or town of Chevy Chase or Chevy Chase section five or whatever. Um, 
My view is that the Comptroller's Office really didn't care to look carefully at these, um, at these uh, filings, and so they did not accurately distribute the money back to the municipalities or the counties. Um, Tacoma Park, according to the audit that was done by the firm that recently went through their, the state's records, um, is to receive $453,000 this month. Um, covering um, taxes that were sent to Montgomery County instead of Tacoma Park since 2010. Um, some jurisdictions lost a lot of money this way. Montgomery County overall is netting $6 million from this process. Um, the Comptroller's Office does not want to go back before 2010, although they acknowledge that the, the problems were from before then as well. Um, and um, there's questions about the accuracy of the $453,000. You know, um, do they have the right list? Um, is this, are these estimates, have they made the changes? Are they going to make the same problems in the future? They did, however, provide us a fairly detailed form that says um, how much money was not sent to us in 2010, in 2011, in 2012, and I've looked at those numbers pretty carefully. Subject of tax duplication. Tacoma Park taxpayers pay taxes to Montgomery County and to Tacoma Park for services only provided by Tacoma Park, several services. And the duplicated amount is to be paid by the county to the city as a rebate. We receive um, payments uh, for um, police rebate in lieu of police, in lieu of crossing guards, in lieu of roads, in lieu of parks and library payment. And um, the police rebate is a calculation that is in the county code. Um, the in lieu of police is more the municipal tax duplication form was related to a formula. Um, together, the police rebate and the in lieu of police um, in FY16 uh, total $3,460,000, which is about half of the police budget of $7 million. Um, the uh, crossing guards, roads, and parks are municipal tax duplication formulas. The library payment is a calculation that is not considered municipal tax duplication, although it's when we finally get some other agreement on municipal tax duplication, it will probably be put back in there. We get a certain amount uh, based on the activity of the county libraries that comes to us. Okay, just, just, just to clarify, mm -hmm. you don't need to go back. 75% of the tax duplication payments essentially are for police-related mm -hmm. Yes, and in fact, when you look at the total amount of um, tax duplication payments that the county pays out, uh, which is only about $13 million total if they do it right, um, you know, a huge portion comes to Tacoma Park simply because of our police department. Uh, the only um, category that goes to every municipality in Montgomery County is the roads um, payment. And the missing wedge, of course, is uh, recreation. That's right. Um, they don't, there are a number of services that are provided in, in a shared way, and recreation is a shared one. We can use Montgomery County Recreation, and, or we can use our own Recreation Department. Um, nevertheless, the Recreation Department of Montgomery County has admitted that they rely on us to provide recreation services for a huge segment of the population in this part of the and, county. And I didn't mean to imply that was the only missing wedge. That's the big No, it's a big it's big a big it's wedge. a very big one, yeah. So we have a working group. Uh, they met and I was on it. I guess I'm still on it to prepare information <laughs> for the county council's uh, government operations committee. There's more work to be done. We did get agreement um, as a committee on an, some expansion of the services to cover, particularly some uh, contributions to three other municipalities for police services that they get nothing for. Um, and there was pretty good agreement on some of the formulas to use for some of the categories. Um, what are those other municipalities? Chevy Chase Village, Gaithersburg, and Rockville. 
we're hoping that the negotiations restart again after this year's budget, but everything's kind of been on hold lately. We also um, kind of not tax, not tax money, but just um, other funds besides could, the general fund. Could yep. I ask a question about the um, tax duplication? Sure. So do you have an estimate roughly of the amount that you think we should be owed for things like um, the recreation, which Mr. Siemens mentioned, and maybe other things that we, you believe we ought to get that we're not getting? A range of it, maybe. You know, I think um, it's not double what we're getting, but it's somewhere. It's it's probably I don't know twenty percent more than we're getting. I would that would think. So that's a couple of million dollars, maybe, or. Yeah, I mean, I think I think so. It, uh, maybe a million more. Um, There's different ways to calculate things. Um, there's some impacts, and, and you have to think about how does it work across other jurisdictions. Um, so it's it's not a completely clean process. Um, things that are shared, such as recreation, get calculated a little bit differently than something that where we do it, which is police services. Um, so it's. I don't have a good figure on that one, um, but when they um, go through the formulas, if they had applied the formulas, we'd be getting a good about a good bit more, and I think we should get just slightly more than that. And um, I think the most important thing is to finally get formulas so we don't fight about it. It is very frustrating. Um, one of the things that will come up. If, the, if this moves forward, is also a discussion about should the payments be coming as a rebate or should they become as a deduction credit on people's property taxes. And there's arguments on both sides of that in jurisdictions according to the kind of the approach that we were looking at would vote on which option they want. So has the county dropped the whole grant proposal? No. The county is try has tried a thing that said, well, we'll pay you this amount in tax duplication, and we know that there should be some extra money, so we'll pay some extra money as a grant. The um, kind of the rub for the county is that there are some jurisdictions that because of the 17% cut in income tax that go to the municipalities, some jurisdictions can do their whole budget off just off their income tax money. They don't need to have property taxes and other services, fees for services. Um, everybody at the county that knows anything about this subject knows Tacoma Park is completely different and that we are owed more money. So one of the things that I think has been successful is that message is there. Mm -hmm. We provide many services. You know, we only get 15% of our budget from income tax money. Um, they know that, that we need um, that we need funds and that um, we contribute to the county and as, a, as making this a better county. Oh, looking, for, looking ahead, you know, one of, I think, our obligations as council members is to be able to help our constituents, taxpayers, understand tax duplication. <clears throat> yep. We all know that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but um, it would be therefore very helpful to be able to come up with a reasonable number of how much it is, as our former mayor Bruce would say, that the, the size of the theft mm -hmm. of tax money is uh, on average from year to year. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not prepared to give that number not tonight. Today. Not today. And that's today. fine. I don't care. Uh, but at some point, I think we we ought to be able to have a number that's reasonably defensible and, and reasonably explainable to, yeah. to our residents. And our county council representative. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, and our county council representative. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, I think that the, uh, that the kind of the gut explanation is important, which is if you're 
paying money to the county for this service and you're paying money to the city for this service and the county is not providing that service, mm -hmm. then it does make sense that you get that money back. Um, so that part is clear. Mm -hmm. um, there's some, you know, it, some of the stuff gets a little bit tough to, to calculate. Mm -hmm. um, there's also one of the things that is, also, is the case um, and it took a while for the county staff to kind of recognize this, is how much municipalities do to, as a partner with the county, to making this county a good place. Mm -hmm. So we may provide a higher level of police service than the county would pay for, but we're also defending this part of the mm -hmm. county in, and making it a better place. We may have more street lights or we may have more uh, street furniture, and it's part of making the county prettier and I think that all of those kinds of things add up to a contribution that we make to the greater good of Montgomery County and and over time there was some recognition that it wasn't just municipalities taking from the county um, and in fact that that we're here as part of the county and that and we have real merits in and of ourselves I mean another example I think and not to, to but drag this out is recreation because a lot of people who do not live in Tacoma Park yeah. use our recreation mm -hmm. programs. And the county has sort of thought the opposite, that somehow or another it didn't work that way. But in fact, oh, the, the, it does. Yeah, and the county rec staff will make it very clear. <laughs> just want to finalize my, my uh, kind of overview by just mentioning some other funds. We have a stormwater fund, and, and Councilmember Koreshi answered this question a little bit ago. Um, but all of our stormwater work is funded by our stormwater fees, and a single family home rate is $55 per year. It is not part of the tax. Um, the speed camera fund is funded by revenue from speed camera funds, fines. Uh, that's about $1.8 million a year. And the special revenue fund consists of various grant monies. For many of our big projects, we have lots of grants. Uh, most come from federal or state programs or the cable franchise agreements. Um, so these don't get counted into the general fund because they can't be used for other purposes, mm -hmm. um, but they do help um, provide the services that we offer. And can you elaborate on what, how we use the money from the speed camera fund? Speed camera funds um, can only be used for um, activities that increase public safety. So... That includes the safe roadways to school. It includes safe, yeah, it includes sidewalks or um, efforts to make um, walk, walking ways across streets better, uh, safer. Um, we use it for some police um, activities uh, and equipment and um, some improvements about so that our streets work better, that kind of thing. So you've asked some questions, but are there some other ones? No, I have all the answers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and wonderful PowerPoint. Is there it you on go. The website? It will be on the website. And I was actually thinking about putting it together with my blog on assessments, and, mm -hmm. and so people can go through and, and read both of those. And then they can ask me questions. I would also say that if it's possible for our wonderful city TV to actually take this part of the city council meeting and make it its own standalone okay. um, piece and put it on the website, okay. I think. This would be something to, um, it would be good to point residents to sure. um, and come back Happy to. Happy to do that. Thank you. I have one will last question. the current week. I'm sorry? This presentation will outlive the current week. Yes, I think we'll look we'll back at it other times. One last question. So, I don't know if others would agree with this, but the assessments can be way off the market value. Yes. And maybe that's nice because, it, you know, your house is assessed a lot less than you could sell it on the market. <laughs> Or maybe the opposite happens. I think when the opposite happens, people tend to seek an adjustment. I haven't seen too many people who seek an adjustment when it's in the other direction. But do we know why they're so far off? I don't know that they're that far off. Um, the, um, they have a system they go through in different areas, and they, um, you know, they do just like any other assessor does. They compare square footage um, and... Um, you know, the, what the kind of improvements are. Uh, they will show you, you know, their worksheet that they used and their comparables. Um, if there's a section where there's a sense that a whole area was off, you know, it would be interesting to know 
uh, what the challenge is on that and, and get that straightened out. Um, I think, you know, just with the, even with the question about why they kind of underguessed our assessments last year or overguessed, I think, um, you know, this area didn't have a lot of change for a while. And so, you know, now there's, there's some new, there's some movement and they're, they're catching up just as everyone else is. Um, are, are the property can, can assessors I? trained appraisers? Are they licensed appraisers? I don't know that. No. I don't know. No, they're not. Because that was the thing that I always couldn't understand is, you know, how do they get these numbers? And if you actually are selling property, whether it's residential or commercial, you can come up with a completely different number. Mm -hmm. And I can understand it for commercial because it's, you know, they don't have access to the rent rolls. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that would have a big uh, implication in the value. But Yeah, I'm, you know, most of the time I'm actually impressed by how well they do on these. Um, and I'm at least impressed with their dedication. The Washington McLaughlin property, for example, um, you know, they had personally gone inside the building. They had looked around. Um, so they, you know... They don't just kind of go off of some kind of a statistical sheet. Um, they do go out and check the properties, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm not able to judge that. Can I can mm -hmm. I co just mm -hmm. comment from from my experience in in, in lending? Mm -hmm. uh, no no lender ever relies on assessments yeah. in determining the value of real estate for whether they're lending for the real estate or just be using the real estate as collateral. Mm -hmm. They always will require an, an individual appraisal of the property done by an, uh, a, a, an appraiser who's got the right credentials. Mm -hmm. right. And that's a different story. Uh, and the thing is, is that um, assessments are almost never going, if it's going to be an accident if the assessment actually turns out to be something close to mark, you know, really right at market value because there's even on one block or similar houses there's a lot of subtle differences mm -hmm. in the way the property is maintained and uh, and things other things that an assessor who's not a, they are not appraisers they're not they don't have they, they can choose to be but they're not necessarily appraisers that are not ever cannot be reflected in, in assessments because this is a this is a very mass process mm -hmm. And it's largely mechanistic, except for individual properties like, say, Washington McLaughlin, which they absolutely have to to take a you know harder look at. Councilmember Mail. Thank you. Um, just a couple of quick follow-ups. Request for information. Mm -hmm. um, the first is that the value of land appeared appears to be done in a somewhat consistent manner. So every house on a street or every house on a block uh, may have a different increase in the value of the home, but the mm -hmm. land. Um, appreciation is the same, but different blocks in the city had different appreciation rates. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's very, very different. So mm -hmm. parts of Ward 2 had, you know, one area was 10% on average land value went up mm -hmm. and house values went up a lot more. Mm -hmm. And another area, land value went way, way up and house values went up not very much. Mm -hmm. um, so to the extent to which there's any explanation of that, that you could get just sort of mm -hmm. general trends across the city mm -hmm. from land values. I'd, I'd appreciate that. Okay. The specific question also to follow up on in land value is at some point our environment committee looked at the existence of easements that protected open space in the community, of mm -hmm. which there is some. Mm -hmm. And those should change the land value because they change, take away the development right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I just appreciate, given that data layer mm -hmm. exists in the, in mm -hmm. the uh, planning department, um, if, if you could check whether that's being properly reflected. And this, just to go back to the question of the inventory, um, the, what I'd really love us to get at, and it doesn't have to be immediately, but it's just to make sure that for the businesses which have, uh, for the businesses located in Tacoma Park, um, let's say there's 200, mm -hmm. uh, how many businesses do we receive inventory tax from? Do they mm -hmm. match up? Mm -hmm. The city knows some of the bigger businesses, right, like Rite Aid is, a, is in mm -hmm. Tacoma Park, that's mm -hmm. correct, right? At the junction, at at, uh, at University of New Hampshire, no. isn't that? Walgreens. That's Walgreens. 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 I'm sorry, Walgreens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. It's across the street. Yeah. yeah, that that would be Walgreens would be presumably have a pretty big in, uh, uh, inventory, mm -hmm. uh, more than the bead mm -hmm. store, mm -hmm. uh, and so it, there are like sort of a top twenty 
list of businesses that the city staff could presumably come up with if they just sitting down at a table and just to make sure that um, people are filling out those forms uh, and that we don't have a significant problem that mm -hmm. very few are filing it and others are not uh, it would just be good to just check that okay um, um, I I will do both of these um, one of the things um, on the later note businesses like Walgreens and stuff they do file this that those seem to be more consistent it's it's kind of the small single proprietor, proprietor folks that sometimes don't even know they need to fill out the paperwork um, that we find. Um, but it certainly will get that information. Um, one of the things I do know about, um, I was talking to Marie Green, who kind of heads the efforts the, to do this, oversees the assessors for Montgomery County. Um, and she was saying that sometimes they had to tweak the value of the land because the overall value had gone up so much and they had to figure out a way to make that work. So sometimes there is some adjustments where you wouldn't think there would be to try to make the overall number work out right. Um, but I'm, I may be able to get that in a more coherent statement um, okay. they could share with you. Thank you. Yeah. Council Member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my question is, can we break out in the property tax what our commercial base is and what we are getting from the multifamily properties in the city. Is that possible? I think possible? we can actually because of Al Carr, because he um, requested a full listing of all of our properties and their assessments, and, um, and it's broken into categories, so we should be able to, to run those numbers. Okay, I think that would be helpful. And we have that database? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I sent it out to you, but I if probably not, did. I sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the same time I was getting lots and lots of messages about people's appraised values. <laughs> so was, Council Member Kovar. Um, just to be clear on, for the inventory tax, mm -hmm. in addition to everything that Council Member Mel just discussed and what we talked about, I think it's important to understand um, what power or authority we have to adjust whatever the amount is. So one thing that would be interesting to see was who's paying it, who maybe should and isn't, but um, I'd like to ha have a clear idea of if, if, if it's set here, could we set it here or here mm -hmm. instead? So, okay, thanks. Great. All right, well, thank you very much for this, and uh, we are adjourned. Love it, love it, love it. Good night. Oh, you're going to testify to me.